Another part of uh, the microbial diseases uh, associated with the lymphatic system and uh, with the cardiovascular system. Again, many of the organisms that we talk about that invade these two systems are used as weapons of, uh, is what we consider it, weapons of mass destruction or bioterroristic agents. Now there's terrorism, there are chemical events, radioactive events, and then there are biological events. The term bioterrorism has kind of taken on this kind of global meaning of chemical, radiological, and biological events, but the word bioterrorism related to biological uh, attacks originally, and again, it's been kind of slurred by the press and in layman's terms, but bioterrorism, as we talk about it today, are related to infectious organisms. Anthrax was one of them. Toluemia can actually be used as well. Uh, We'll talk about some other agents as well. We talked about, I believe, smallpox we did during uh, the uh, uh, infectious organisms that can attack the integumentary system. But as you can see, plagues have been used in the past. Um, the use of smallpox as a weapon uh, was used by uh, U.S. Cavalry and other um, uh, uh, organizations uh, in the past. Anthrax has been used uh, previously as attacks as well, as you can see, by the Soviet Union and then certain enteric types of organisms, um, uh, botulism for example, have been used uh, previously as well. Biological weapons, bacteria, and viruses that have been used. And then there's also the concern now about viruses that have previously been eradicated, such as the polio virus and many forms of measles, as a weapon that can be used now not necessarily to kill. Now smallpox has about a 25 to 30 percent mortality rate um, and if you don't receive a vaccination say within the first four days of being infected then um, most individuals will certainly become sick and incapacitated but 25 to 30 percent of people will die from it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, insults with uh, measles, forms of encephalitis, again may be able to treat that not cure it, but you can treat it until the person can form immune, immunities to be able to fight it off. But the problem is it will incapacitate uh, a military force, it will incapacitate cities, it will destroy infrastructure, so it can lead to major problems. So it is important that we're aware of it. As you can see, this table lines up bacteria and viruses that could be considered uh, used as a biological weapon. Now some of these organisms obviously to be able to disperse them, to be able to grow them in quantity enough to be destroyed are points of issue. But for Shigella, for Vibrio cholera, uh, I mean no problem. I mean just get some bad soup and just let it grow and then just spread it someplace, not a big deal. You know, some of the other agents, again the people who will develop this place themselves at risk and what many of the surveillance organizations hope for best case scenario would be that you would see an outbreak in a particular region where terroristic activity was at and you would be able you at least be able to give you some type of uh, early warning that the potential of this is occurring um, but uh, we'll, we'll go through that a lot more in the course this weekend if you're able to uh, attend it's a little bit more than what we had the time for to go through today uh, here uh, some other conditions that you should be familiar with and then organisms that cause it Ischemia is a term that you all are already probably familiar with. It just basically means an inadequate, not enough, inadequate amount of blood supply to a tissue area or an organ. Necrosis is the death of that tissue from prolonged ischemia. Gangrene is the death of soft tissue. Now gangrene can occur in the absence of bacteria, but in most cases when we see gangrene, especially the term gas gangrene, then an infectious organism is there. Gas gangrene comes from the term that the microorganism as a part of its metabolism is producing a gas. And the gas can be seen in the tissue. You take an x-ray of the tissue, you actually see little tracks of air in the tissue. You know, tissue, soft tissue is not supposed to have air in it. Well, oxygen, but it's diffused in the bloodstream, so technically speaking, yeah, but I mean like air in the tissue is what you see. And one of the major organisms that we see that in is Clostridium. Clostridium, Clostridium perfinges, gram-positive, endospore-forming aerobic rods, grows, grows in necrotic tissue. Treatment includes surgical removal of the necrotic tissue. Person gets snake-bitten, causes significant inflammation and swelling, 
The snake secretes a coagulase, which destroys tissue. Tissue becomes necrotic. Snakes out in the environment probably got a little clostridium on it. You get gas gangrene. The toxin from the snake causes systemic problems. That's one problem. But the other problem is the gas gangrene that you get in the extremity wherever you got bit. Funny story, had a guy, this was, I was working in the emergency room in a little rural town in Mississippi, and the guy was in his truck, in the back of the truck, because he had been drinking and his friend was driving, down a country road and he saw a snake. He knocked on the window, his friend stopped the truck, first mistake. Second mistake, the guy got out of the truck, drunk. <laughs> Third mistake is he tried to catch the snake. And so <laughs> he grabbed the snake and the snake bit him. As if that wasn't enough, he said he was mad, so he tried to grab the snake again. And it bit him twice. And then he decided, before it bit him the third time, that, wow, I've been bit by a snake twice. I should catch it so I can take it to the emergency room and show it to him what bit me. So he caught it. It bit him a third time while he was catching it. But he did, he did put it in a can. He brought it. To, I was like, I don't, I, don't need to see, I don't need to see this thing. So, but anyway, he, he did. And the problem was, not, he received antivenom and all that stuff, but he got sick. This guy was sick. And I, I just, I guess the alcohol must have saved him. I don't know for sure. But it, it pickled his system, and you know maybe all the toxins didn't work. I don't know, but it was uh, the the bad thing was, it, you know, two three days out, the toxic effect is gone. But the problem was he lost his arm because the the the, the venom, the coagulase, just I mean his hand was black in a day, and it proceeded up his arm. And you know we sent him. The, the one of the problems with the snake bite is <clears throat> nobody wants to take care of it because it's an ugly wound. And, and it's nothing really you can do for it. You know, you let it run its course, and when you see the tissue's not going to survive, you, you know, either you do major tissue revision or you lose the extremity. In his case, he lost the extremity. So, uh, <clears throat> lessons learned. But he still had his right hand. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, another organism, animal bites and scratches. Uh, Pasturilla modicodi. Uh, is another organism. Clostridium is another one. Bacteroides is another one. Fusiform bacterium. Uh, Bartonella. <coughs> Bartonella is uh, famed for the famous cat scratch fever. Cat scratch fever a lot of times is uh, confused with many forms of lymphoma that can occur in individuals, um, uh, especially household cats. Uh, individuals can get scratched by the cat and develop lymph nodes. It's, it, you develop lymph nodes in the extremity where you were scratched from. And uh, a lot of individuals that play with cats, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma in early presentations may have small discrete nodes that are inflamed. And so sometimes there's some mixed diagnosis between cat scratch fever and lymphomas. But uh, just another organism to be concerned about. There are various types of plagues. Plagues are known for being able to be uh, an exposure of a bacterial uh, antigen to a particular area that can then run rampant in populations. Typically, a spread by some type of uh, rodent, <clears throat> rats, squirrels, prairie dogs are excellent examples of that. Uh, as a reservoir, the vector, typically a bug or an insect of some sort. Um, then the bubonic plague, which I received a lot of press and has received a lot of press in the past, is basically a bacterial growth, gets in the bloodstream, then gets in the lymphatic system, and then spreads. Septicemia plague, septic shock, pneumonotic plagues, um, where you basically get pneumonia and or bullous formations of bacteria inside the lung tissue itself. So again, the, the problem is usually the pest control because it's not transmitted from person to person. It's usually via you know, the vector uh, that's transmitting the, the infection to uh, populations. Uh, these are some various areas where if you consider the term plague being used when you look at the United States that we see a number of cases of plagues either from uh, not, not necessarily bubonic plague, that's not what I'm talking about, but other conditions where we see uh, vectors and reservoirs being, being involved. Relapsing fever is another term that we see for an organism referred to as Borrelia. We've talked about Borrelia before. This is a spirochete reservoir reservoir where the organism is going to be found at and uh, multiply would be the rodent and the vector where it's being transmitted from would be a tick 
tick bites the rodent, falls off, then bites you, and you get successive relapses in fever is the typical presentation for Borrella. Uh, again, uh, this is the type of organism that can lead to uh, significant uh, infectious processes in the body. Typically, presentations are like with fevers and chills, <clears throat> but t depending on the load of the organism, it can lead to significant problems. Lyme's disease, and um, uh, Lyme's disease is, several cases of Lyme's are reported each year, also still gets a little media attention. Borrelia, again, is the organism. The reservoir are the deer. The vectors, again, are the ticks. Again, the deer is where the organism will grow at. The tick will bite the deer, then the tick will fall off the deer, and then will bite you at some point, and you will pick up the disease. Here's just the uh, life cycle. These life cycles are uh, in your book. This basically shows you the life cycle of Lyme disease, how the uh, tick is out there on its own, then will bite a particular rodent. Then during the winter or the fall, you'll see it lie dormantly. goes through the cycle of where then you come out with your dog, your dog gets bit by the tick, or you get bit by the tick, or the dog gets bit by the tick, it falls off in the house, lives in the carpet, and then you get bit by the tick, however you get the tick, it bites you. And then the uh, um, uh, organism will then go through the cycle again where the adult will feed on the deer male, and the cycle starts again where the eggs are formed. And this is a continual cycle, and we again see presentations of Lyme's disease periodically. Nice uh, fluorescent uh, picture of the spirilla associated with Lyme's disease, and again the little booger that causes the uh, spread, the vector, the tick. Some symptoms, Lyme disease, uh, bullseye rash is what it's referred to as, very typical rash. If you know this is an atinea infection, and usually the amount of redness tells you that it's tinea or fungal infection, usually the amount of redness and the circular pattern of it. And sometimes this inflammation gets so intense, but usually a central area is usually clear, and that's what's referred to as the bullseye. Central area is that it's typically clear, typical of Lyme's disease. Second phase, irregular heartbeat. You may even develop encephalitis, inflammation in the covering of the brain, and then the third phase would be a form of arthritis. Uh, you'll see many of the um, uh, organisms that are spirochete in nature will develop arthritis. Syphilis is an excellent example of that as well, palladinium. This organism will also get in the bloodstream. It initially can cause a neuroform, a neurosyphilis, and then a, another form of syphilis is a syphilis arthritis that can occur as well. So. Uh, a lot of these organisms you'll see with same presentations. Why? Because again, in the inflammatory process, organism gets in the bloodstream, goes through circulation. When you get to the point of the small blood vessels, small blood vessels that go, say, th from your fingers, small blood vessels at the elbow joints, knees, will become clogged up, and the immune response will get into that area where these antigen antibodies have hung up at and cause inflammation in the joint areas. Urkeliosis is another organism as well. Again, reservoir, deer, rodents, vectors or ticks. Common theme with all of these organisms. Typhus, uh, epidemic typhus, which caused from uh, rickettsia, reservoir being the rodent. And again, Pediculus humanus corporis, which you studied already in your lab, transmitted when uh, the last feces is rubbed into the wound of the bite. I know, nice. Um, there are epidemic forms that can occur as well, rickettsia typhi, reservoir again, the rodent, and again, another vector, Xenolophysilla. Here's an example of a, a, a rash-like presentation associated with rickettsia. You may have heard this term used before as well, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, this is a classical presentation of it. Measles-like rash, except the rash appears on the palms and the soles as well. Typical measles, you, the palms are spared, uh, the soles of the feet are spared, but in this particular case, you see the lesions will present there uh, as well. And this is just a distribution of where you see the organism uh, affecting uh, in the highest percentages, as you can see, along the northeastern, southeastern borders is a pretty high concentration of uh, this organism. This is the tick life cycle. Again, you're rubbing those eggs in that open wound. Uh, not a good thing. Uh, eggs will hatch 
bite the rabbit and at some point will infect and or bite the human in the disease process.